Hello my dear friends and net aspirants welcome back to high point again i hope all of you are great in your lives and we are you know ceaselessly we are preparing for ugc net upcoming ugc net exam which is within 10 days are going to happen so i hope you are preparing for your best for this examination and we will face it so bravely we i know that and uh, yeah so uh, in the previous video we have already seen part one of previous questions from the session poetry so like i said uh, when i saw uh, the previous question paper when i was categorizing all these uh, questions and all it was like you know i saw abundance of questions from the section poetry it was not from a uh, drama or from fiction or non-fiction but from poetry itself you can find enormous amount of questions exactly you know the same question is exactly the same way repeated several times so it's like poetry you have to when you learn poetry you have to be very keen about learning it do not go very uh, you know uh, superficially about learning when you learn poetry but uh, you go deep at least the important uh, poets you uh, for when they when you learn them go deep and keen and learn at least about their important work so learning and uh, you know going through previous question paper one advantage is that you know you can understand after you know uh, seeing many questions you can understand which all things are favorites of this ugc people because they are always asking uh, a set kind of uh, a set amount of works or poets okay so and poetry is present in every other age in every other uh, you know uh, type of literature that we have not only in english literature but in every other uh, topic indian literature post colonial literature european literature or american literature you can find the presence and the genre poetry everywhere in every other literature so that is the universality universality of this uh, particular genre so it's like you know uh, adding a question or asking a question from poetry is a kind of very easy job they can ask from anything and every from anywhere they can also ask it's like an ocean okay so in the previous uh, video we have already seen the first 50 question uh, now we will see the question number 51 and now we will are uh, going to see next 50 question okay from uh, poetry so here we have the question in traditional individual talent T.S. Eliot uses the analogy of the catalyst to elucidate his theory of impersonal poetry. He cites the example of a filament of platinum in the poetic process this is equivalent to. So we know that lots of questions are asking uh, from this particular essay from this particular work work of criticism by T.S. Eliot traditional and individual talent T.S. Eliot belong to the modern age and he has written this uh, you know uh, this particular essay in order to uh, show what is the importance of traditional uh, traditional things and what is mean by tradition and how it is important relevant in the modern and postmodern era uh, and uh, you know uh, you, he also says uh, you know a poetry should be impersonal so a poet should not you know should not be visible in a poetry so in order to emphasize that example he brings about an analogy uh, that he says that uh, platinum is uh, uh, when he, a plas platinum rod is or filament is bring in contact with the uh, you know uh, sulfur and uh, um, oxygen then sulfuric acid will form but the final product won't have any trace of platinum so in that way he is discussing he is uh, emphasizing uh, you know his point of impersonal poetry by citing this example so we have to understand we have to say uh, we have to identify uh, why he what he meant by filament of platinum so fil filament of uh, platinum is equivalent to what okay the language of the poet the mind of the poet the soul of the poet the life of the poet see he says that the mind uh, the mindset of poet is very relevant in writing a poetry but that should not be quite visible in the poetry 
Light platinum is not visible in the uh, no trace of platinum can be seen in the final product. Okay, so the uh, correct answer is the mind of the poet. So the light platinum is invisible. Platinum is not seen. Its qualities are not there in the final product. Just like that, the mind of poet, the presence of the mind of the poet is very important. But still, that should not be reflected in, or that cannot be, or should not be seen in the uh, in poetry or any artistic work. So that's how it should be impersonal. Okay. Next, next question: Which of the following images does not figure in Auden's Musi des Vuex Art? So W H uh, Auden has written a poem known as Musi des Vuex Art. So basically, he actually brings about uh, uh, he talks about three paintings here that he found in a gallery. Uh, so the paintings are Icarus falling from the sky and another painting is the crucifixion of Christ and sec third one is the infant Jesus. So these are the three paintings and he is uh, citing how human beings are in difference to the sufferings of people. Okay, so we have to identify which image uh, that he is not uh, explaining that he is not using uh, in this particular poem. So a boy falling out of the sky of, uh, sky, of course it is there. Children skating on a pond at the edge of wood. So while uh, Icarus was falling from the sky, he actually says that there are people who are working in the farm nearby that pond and uh, he, uh, children are playing there. But they all are indifferent to the suffering of Icarus. Then ranges of isolation and the busy griefs. The dogs go on with their doggy lives. So basically... This third image is not there in Auden's poem Musi des Buex Arts. Next one, next uh, question is, uh, so here is a line from Ulysses, okay. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, descend not to fail in the offices of tenderness. So this is a line from Ulysses. Ulysses is a poem written by whom? Written by written by Tennyson, right? Ulysses is a poem written by Tennyson. He belongs to the uh, which age? The age of Victorian. And he, why uh, he is, uh, that Ulysses is telling about Telemachus. So by telling, the, he cites the quality of Telemachus. So by telling this quality, what does he mean? What do Ulysses suggest about the character of Telemachus? Okay, he shows heroic qualities. He is patient and selfless. He is very much like his father. He may be too tender hearted for a king. So he is heroic. No, he is not. From these lines, we cannot say that Telemachus is heroic. But Ulysses is hero, heroic because, because he fought in many wars and he traveled a lot. He was adventurous. So he has heroic qualities. But from these lines, we cannot find that Telemachus is heroic. But he is patient and selfless. Yeah, he is so blameless. And he is centered in the sphere of common duty. See, he is very much suitable for becoming a king because he can stick on uh, to these common, not so special common duties. And uh, he never fails to be tender and soft and patient when it comes to the duties of his offices. Okay. The third option we can find, he is very much like his, but no, Telemachus is not at all like Ulysses. Ulysses is so adventurous. He wants to go on in adventurous, uh, you know, voyages even in his, you know, late years. He may be too tender hearted for a king. No, that is not also the meaning of this line. So the answer is option B, he is patient and selfless. Next one is, who is the author of the poem, The Defense of Lucknow, dealing with the siege of Lucknow, one of the terrible incidents of the Indian mutiny? So, uh, one of the authors, one of the uh, poets has written this particular work, The Defense of Lucknow, and we have to know, we have to understand and find out who has written it. Rudyard Kipling, Edward Lear, then uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, Robert Brown. So, it was... Uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, who has written about uh, the uh, one of the episodes of Indian Mutiny and the title, The Defense of Lucknow. So, pause this video and learn, okay, at least read once uh, these uh, words and these uh, titles and, uh, you know, at least one or once or twice repeat in your mind, uh, you know, the, uh, the title name and the author's name, okay. The next question, in my last duchess, 
which of the following is not one of the duchesses miss demures according to the duke see my last duchess is by browning uh, belongs to the victorian age and uh, in that uh, you know in that particular poem duke is actually telling why he committed such a crime of killing uh, her uh, sorry uh, killing his duchess uh, his last duchess and he is actually citing many um, you know uh, misbehaviors misdemeanors from her side so you have to find which is not uh, one of the duchess's misdemeanors that according to duke she was flattered by compliments from fra pandolf see fra pandolf is the one who actually uh, painted the portrayal of uh, this duchess of the duke okay the late duchess of the duke and while uh, while the envoy was asking about this particular portrayal and uh, uh, the duke began to describe about it so the poem uh, begins with frappendorf the word uh, the name frappendorf so that is correct he has this allegation against her and she enjoyed the sunset as much as he enjoyed her husband's favor see uh, her husband is a duke so uh, his royalty so he says that see i gave her a gift of a popular name i made her a royalty but she enjoyed the sunset even the minute things uh, that is there in the uh, that is surrounded there and you know so uh, he uh, he was enjoy she was enjoying she wouldn't listen to her husband when uh, he tried to correct her behavior it was like you know she, he she was a spirit uh, you know she was a very simple innocent and uh, uh, that kind of a woman but even though he was distra uh, disturbed by her behavior he never tries to you know uh, correct her or i won't say that he needs to correct her it's her it's his perversion uh, that he is telling is it's his insecurity that he is uh, like you know uh, telling as uh, her misbehaving things and all but still she was equally grateful for all the acts of kindness regardless of their uh, sources so even if we can see if you remember the poem there uh, a, 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 in, a, in a particular position duke is saying that see, if somebody gives her a, a rose flower then she will be very happy and she will smile at them she will smile at everybody it's not that she won't keep any an air and a kind of uh, high position for herself and she is very common and she is so mingling with everyone so it's like you know even the humblest and uh, very simple act or act she is very kind uh, you know she is very grateful and you know whoever is doing that for her she is very grateful to them so it's like option c is the correct answer she wouldn't listen to her husband when he tried to correct her behavior the next question elizabeth barrett browning sonnet from portuguese is so elizabeth barrett browning has written a uh, sonnet sequence uh, a collection of sonnets in the title sonnets from uh, portuguese and what is it it's a sequence of 44 petrarchan sonnets a rewriting of poppy and didactic verse a depiction of a contemporary setting and a small events of ordinary life a scathing criticism of the british colonial empire so you have to uh, you know actually take correct quotes correct quote from this given quotes okay so the answer is option b one and three so elizabeth barrett browning browning's sons from portuguese is uh, a sequence of 44 petrarchan sonnets so this particular collection contains 44 petrarchan sonnets and also it's a depiction of a contemporary setting and small events of ordinary life so do you remember that about this sonnet collection next one dante gabriel rossetti founded the pre-raphaelite brotherhood which included so you have to identify who are who all are known as pre-raphaelite uh, poets from this given list holman hunt arthur hugh clo gerard manley hopkins then john melais option b one and four is the correct answer so holman hunt is there john melis is there so these two are the uh, uh, pre-raphaelite poets from the given given a list of poets and dandy gabriel rossetti belongs to which age the victorian age and he uh, and his companion he's a 
painter and he painter turned poet and he and his companion together formed pre-raphaelite brotherhood it's a movement of victorian age and also um, it is also known as fleshy school of poetry and that it, it is not a positive criticism positive uh, word or positive term given to this uh, particular movement but it is a negative term but uh, this is also known as fleshy school of poetry and uh, Rande Gabriel Rossetti's the blessed damasur is one of the uh, you know fundamental or uh, fundamental poetry that shows all the uh, qualities of pre-raphaelite poetry okay remember all these things then next question in the second ending of John Fowles the French lieutenant's woman Charles Smithson uh, Smithson's lawyer finds that Sarah has been living in the house of okay so John Fowles he belongs to which age he belongs to uh, the postmodern age and this poem uh, actually this is not related to directly re related to poetry but the answer of this particular uh, this particular question is uh, related to poetry because the answer is the poet's name Okay, French Lieutenant Woman is a, is a tremendous work and it contains three alternate ending. The readers can choose any one of them according to their, you know, desired, uh, you know, version of the story. And towards the end of the second ending, we can find that Smithson's lawyer, Charles Smithson is the, uh, you know, not, we cannot say hero, but he, he is in love with Sarah Woodruff. Sarah Woodruff is the title character. And Sarah, uh, he finds that, I mean, the lawyer finds that Sarah has been living in the house of painters. And she was living with D.G. Rossetti, Dandy Gabriel Rossetti, okay. He is a pre raphaelite poet. Poet and painter. Next one. Which statement best expresses the theme of Coleridge's The Rhyme of Ancient Mariner? So, Rhyme of Ancient Mariner is a wonderful work and this is also... Uh, we can find in lyrical ballads two colleges four poems are there in lyrical ballads when it was published in 1798 and rhyme of the ancient mariner is the first poem okay rhyme of the ancient mariner is the first poem in lyrical ballads and uh, it contains 10 stanzas okay the rhyme of ancient mariner has 10 stanzas so what is the statement or what is the message or theme, fundamental theme of this poem? So the option A, to kill a living creature is immoral. People should honor and respect all living things. Prayer can accomplish miracles. True harmony is achieved only through corporate efforts. See, some or other way, every, uh, every one of these themes are there in this uh, uh, rhyme. But we have to, uh, you know, find out the best statement which can express the theme of the particular poem so option b is the correct answer people should honor and respect all living things see see everything turns upside down when uh, the the speaker of the poem kills an arbitro arbitros okay so that actually causes every other atrocities that uh, the speaker is going to face or speaker faced throughout this uh, poem and after that the ship in which he was traveling, it, it was cursed and he remained there as a sole living person while all others, uh, uh, all others were died or, you know, uh, died out of, uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden something misfortunate happens. So, uh, this is a wonderful poem. If you have, if you are interested, then you have to at least go through it. Uh, so, the, the, the living creature or the bird in, which is... Uh, uh, which, which got killed in this particular poem is albatross okay remember that i have seen that question so next question is who among the following greek philosophers has a bearing on the composition of shelley's adonia so basically the question is uh, why shelley is creating adonias he is uh, influenced by whom by in, influenced by which greek philosopher it is plato okay he was influenced by Plato. Shelley was influenced by Plato while he was composing Adonai. So Adonai is an elegy about John Keats. Remember that. Next. Next question. What would help a reader recognize Keats to what would help a reader to recognize Keats to Autumn as a poem from the Romantic period? So Keats belongs to 
the age of uh, romanticism and he belongs to the second generation romantic poets and he has composed a, an ode uh, titled as to autumn sorry to to autumn to autumn so uh, keats uh, in order to understand uh, keats poem to autumn what will help the reader most uh, you know from the giving uh, from the given uh, options its logical succession of images its uh, concise use of couplets its lavish natural imagery its use of iambic pentameter so he actually uh, he he is uh, frustrated about many things and he is actually comparing his frustration to the season autumn okay so its lavish natural imagery is the correct answer answer this will help uh, the reader to recognize but this particular poem to autumn uh, as a poem from romantic period and natural imagery the abundance and lavish natural imagery is one of the major feature of uh, romantic uh, poetry next question so here four lines are given you have to understand uh, the uh, the figure of speech so this description is an example of what which figure of speech okay Oh, for a drought of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delth earth, testing of flora and the country green, dance the provincial song, the and sunburnt mirth. So this is synesthesia. So here he uh, we can find it's a description that exemplifies synesthesia. Okay, the next one. Keats La Belle Dame San Mercy combines two poetic forms. So Keats has written a particular poem known as La Belle Dame Saint Mercy. So this uh, title means only this merciless young woman. Okay. So it combines two poetic forms, which are the lyric, dramatic monologue, ballad, sonnet. So it basically combines, um, you know, lyric and ballad. Option C is correct. One and three. So lyric and ballad. So uh, this particular poem, La Belle Dame Saint Mercy, combines lyric and ballad uh, two poetic forms in it do you remember that and this particular poem is written by john keats of romantic age next poem sorry next question samuel johnson's lives of the english poets combines the following except so while samuel johnson uh, writing about the biographies of different english poets he actually uh, not only just telling about the poet's, uh, you know, life and all major events, but he is going deep into uh, their poems. He is analyzing. He is co making comments about them. Uh, so he he is doing many things. So what he is not doing, what he has not uh, done while he was writing lives of the English poets. So he was analytical. He was uh, uh, telling literary history. Then he was telling, of course, personal biography. But he never. Uh, uh, did Socratic dialogue okay yeah the next question Alexander Pope revised the rape of the lock three times so how many times did Alexander Pope revise his work the rape of the lock three times you got that point from there in the final version of the poem in 1770 he inserted a speech by so actually he revised this particular mock heroic poem three times while he was doing the final uh, revision uh, and he published it in 1770 he in, in, inserted a speech by okay uh, he inserted a speech by uh, one of the characters delivering uh, delivered by one of the characters you have to identify which character is delivering that particular speech that he inserted in the final revision of the poem whether it is by Belinda, Belinda is the major character whose rape uh, of the lock is happening actually, whose lock was stolen and uh, you know, uh, later she suffers for it and Clarissa is there, Betty is there, Telestris is there. Telestris is one of the spirit that actually try to protect Belinda, Belinda's lock and Belinda from any other danger. So the speech is delivered by Clarissa, okay, speech is delivered by Clarissa only. The next question, James Thompson's long poem, The Seasons, revised and expanded all his life, began in the first instance as a poem entitled. So, actually, uh, 
James Thomson belongs to the age of sensibility. That is a small age. Uh, we can find between the neoclassical age and the age of romanticism. And uh, you know, in uh, uh, the in this transitional period, in this uh, age of uh, sensibility, you can find uh, elegies like uh, you know, elegy written in a country church here by Thomas Gray and all. And it is a kind of anticipatory age for romantic age. And Thomson belongs to that age. And he published a poem known as, it's a very long poem, The Seasons. And he actually revised it uh, many times during his lifetime. And when he was began revising it, what was the first instance uh, it was titled? So what was the first title that it possessed initially? Whether it is spring, summer, winter or autumn, it was winter. Okay. The next question, who among the following contemporaries of John Dunn wrote the following lines on his death? Here lies a king that rules as he thought fit, the universal monarch of wit. So this is a, a particular uh, line which was composed upon the death of John Dunn. John Dunn belonged to uh, the 16th, uh, sorry, 17th century. And John Donne is a metaphysical poet and one of the major exponents of metaphysical poet. He has uh, written the valediction for winning morning, good morrow, canonization, uh, holy sonnets and many more poems. And that be not proud included in holy sonnets. So you have to remember all those things. So uh, John Donne uh, when uh, uh, on his death, okay, this line was uh, written by someone. You have to identify and this person is contemporary of John Donne. So that is a hint given here. So you have to identify the person who actually created this particular statement about John Donne's death or of John Donne when he died. Whether it is uh, George Herbert, Henry King, uh, Thomas Carew and Henry Cashew. See the, all these people are uh, metaphysical poets only and uh, Thomas Carew is the one who said about John Donne on his death. What was the line? Here lies a king that rules as he thought fit, the universal monarch of wit. Next question. The term poetic justice to designate the idea the good are rewarded and the evil punished, devised by. So who actually created this term? Poetic justice. So we often hear that in Shakespearean drama there is no poetic justice. So what is poetic justice? It's ultimately the good idea or good people they will get rewarded. They will get redemptions and all. But the ultimately the evil get punished. Whatever tricks and schemes they are doing they will get punished. So this particular term in literature devised or used by whom? Okay, whether it is by uh, Aristotle or John Dryden or Thomas Raymer or Ben Johnson. So it was by Thomas Raymer. So whenever you hear poetic justice, you have to remember Thomas Raymer. Okay, next question. The medal. The, the medal is a poem written by John Dryden in 1681. The subtitle of John Dryden. See, about subtitles and all, I am going to uh, give you posts uh, and, uh, you know, small videos in my Instagram and in my YouTube channel too. So, you, if you subscribe, then you will get immediate notification when I, uh, you know, publish such kind of short videos. So, medal uh, is a poem written by John Dryden. You got that point, right? And it is in 1681. So what is the subtitle of this poem? So, uh, a satire against sedition, a satire against tyranny, a satire against greed, a satire against apostasy. So it is a satire against sedition. Okay. The next question. As Sydney argues in a defense of poetry, which discipline is more useful and praiseworthy, history or poetry? So this is, if you know anything about the defense of poetry, you can answer it blindfolded. Because Sidney is always in favor to poetry. That's how he is defending poetry. He is always telling the wealthiness of poetry more than any other discipline. Whether it is history, whether it is philosophy or science, poetry comes first. Uh, more, you know, uh, more delicate and more useful than any other, um, any other subject, any other discipline according to Sydney and Sydney gives ample uh, proofs and uh, reasons uh, for it. So you have to uh, identify the statement 
okay he is in favor of poetry that you already know so the history being captivate uh, to truth is more useful than see uh, more useful than poetry so in this statement it is not that uh, uh, you know uh, poetry is not given that much credit so we can obviously reject this one poetry where men can see virtue exalted and vice punished is more useful than history so here poetry is given more weightage so we can consider that statement history is more useful than so no need to read even that sentence because uh, history is given more weightage that sydney won't do and history and poetry are synonymous and so both are useful so here poetry is given more weightage you can choose that uh, particular statement but that particular uh, option blindfolded because sydney is giving more weightage to poetry everywhere in his defense of poetry see i have done a particular video about it you can go and check it and listen to the various points and various criticism that he is making about poet about the contemporary literature as well as about the worthiness of poetry okay the next question who among the following is not an imagist you cannot you have to find out who is not an imagist poetry poet so images imagism as a movement emerged or popularized during the modern age so image as rapont uh, emmy lovell and d whom so these are imagist poets and wb yates he is not an imagist poet but he is an irish uh, poet you have to remember that so Please also learn that who are the images poets from this question? Ezra Pound, Amy Lovell, and D. Whom? These are major images uh, poets. And but W. B. Yeats, he is not an images poet. See Ezra Pound, Amy Lovell, and D. Whom? These are American poets too. So remember that. The next question: T. S. Eliot found spiritual support in. Since T. S. Eliot's major work is uh, what? Major work is the Wasteland. So obviously, when you know about Wasteland, the poem ends with some, you know, reference to Hindu mythology and all, Hindu philosophy or Indian philosophy or uh, Oriental philosophy. So it's like we may think that it is Hinduism, but in the second session of this particular poem, he refers to a red rock. So everybody should come under the shadow of red rock, and where we can see that it is referred to Christianity. So he actually found spiritual support in Christianity, not in Hinduism, not in Buddhism, Judaism. So anyway, all these hints are there in that poem, but still he directly or indirectly he says Christianity is the uh, is where he found spiritual. Support. Okay. The next question is in traditional individual talent. See another question from the same essay. According to T. S. Eliot, the term traditional usually means. So he talks generally talks about the individuality of uh, uh, works as well as the importance of tradition. How these two things should coexist. Uh, in a within a literary piece of work why how traditional things are important traditional uh, is important in literature and how individual talent is also important so he says that usually what what is the assumption of tradition in our mind okay whether it is positive whether it is negative or whether it is historical whether it is like something very old but usually everybody see traditional as something very negative especially in modern times because in modern age it's a kind of age that actually deviated consciously from the so far belief systems and customs and traditional things so it's it was like T.S. Eliot was panic about it and he was defending tradition in this in such a way that see you cannot you know completely devoid of tradition because in a world where the dead poet shows their great presence that is the most individual and that's the most purple passage of that particular work so in, in that way he justified tradition and as well as uh, he also mentions that you know individual talent should be there uh, the poet's mind is important but it should not should not show explicitly in the poem so he says that usually about a tradition they have a negative assumption that is they usually mean something negative for people but it is not so and tradition is something very important that everybody should every literary person or those who are studying literature literature should have the next one when was the english ban on james joyce's ulysses lifted 
So this was not about poetry, but still I included it here. So uh, James Joyce's Ulysses is an enormous work, and it was banned in Engl for English for, for English audience. As that means in England. But when this uh, in which year this ban was lifted? It was in the year 1936, and it was published in the year 1922. Next question, which of the following poems by Philip Larkin is best described as a self-elegy anticipating the poet's death? So, Philip Larkin has written a self-elegy anticipating and thinking about his own death. So, Philip Larkin, he is a movement poet, belonged to the postmodern era and he has written uh, poems like Church Going. Okay, Church Going and uh, it's his... Uh, you know, we all have learned it in your MA classes or somewhere we have learned, right? So, he has, which is his self-elegy, self-anticipating, uh, death-anticipating elegy, okay? The old fools obeyed ambulances, faith healing. So, it is obeyed. Obeyed is the uh, self-elegy, anticipating his own uh, death, or Philip Larkin has written. The next question, Emily Dickinson's use of poi, open form or free uh, verse is comparable to her contemporary American poet. See, Emily Dickinson, he, she is a American poet and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dickinson belongs to the which age of American um, literature? Uh, she belongs to the 19th century or pro uh, probably we can see. Uh, the Romantic Age of American Literature and Emily Dickinson has written and you know more, very many poems like more than 2000 and all she has written and she has not published uh, that much poems while she was re, you know she was uh, alive and she was not intended to pu uh, publish all those poems. So Emily Dickinson's uh, free open uh, free form and uh, uh, or open form or free verse form is that kind of use is comparable to her one of her contemporary American poets. And who is that? And Bradstreet, Robert Lovell, Walt Whitman, Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath is not a contemporary of Emily Dickinson, okay? And uh, Robert Lovell is not a contemporary of Emily Dickinson. So, the answer is Walt Whitman. The next question, which is the... Uh, Another term to describe art for art's sake. So art for art's sake is a popular term that we all are familiar with and it belongs to the Victorian age and you know many more poems uh, I mean poets are uh, believing art for art's sake that art should be valued for its own merits. Uh, it should not be you know criticized and should not be tested for its value uh, you know with uh, some rules and regulations that stands out of this uh, uh, this uh, particular work and also it should have valued for its aesthetic qualities. So that is the major argument of art for art's sake movement. So uh, the, a particular movement of Victorian age actually put forward this argument. So it was aestheticism. So art for art's sake is best described as aesthetic or best uh, described in another term uh, that is aestheticism. Uh, it is not didactism, it is not realism, or it is not neo-realism. And aestheticism or aesthetic movement is one of the major movements of the Victorian age, along with the Oxford movement and pre-Raphaelite brotherhood. The next question. In which of the following points does Tennyson describe and condemn the spirit of aestheticism, whose sole religion is the worship of beauty? See, for a, for in, for a work... What is the major value of that work? Which is the beauty for aesthetic people. So those who followed the movement of aestheticism. It's like you should worship. You should find validation for a particular work. For its beauty. Not of its uh, instructional quality. Not of its discussion of any other uh, historical things. Or any other social or political things. Or cultural things and all. But it should be solely worshipped for its own beauty. So that was there one of the. Uh, you know, one of the arguments. And, you know, Tennyson was so critical about it and of knowledge of for their own sake and which ignores human responsibility and obligation of one's fellow men. So, now, even if the work contains nothing like that, even if it's, it is not describing and discussing anything uh, relevant, that is 
that is needed for that society if it is beautiful it need to be worshipped and recognized so aestheticism uh, as a movement argues these things but tennyson in one of his poems he criticizes this he addresses and he condemns this the, the spirit of aestheticism so which was that poem whether it is the princess or the lady of shallot the palace of art or tithonus so the correct answer is the palace of art so from this question you have to learn uh, the uh, all these works are written by tennyson and the palace of art especially written by tennyson and he condemns and he describes the follies of uh, the movement aestheticism okay the next question robert browning's rabi ben isra is a defense of see in this particular poem which is written by rabi ben isra is written by browning browning belonged to the victorian age and he is popular for dramatic monologues so remember all those uh, you know details okay browning is defending something in this poem what is that youth against old age old age against youth power against knowledge knowledge against power so he is defending all age against youth in this poem rabi ben isra next uh, question in the opening stanza of song of myself whitman begins his spiritual awakening at the age of see uh, song of myself is written by whitman walt whitman he is an american poet and he belongs to the romantic age of american poet and he is also a transcendentalist so you can remember these kind of point, points while you uh, you know while you revise about a poet and he in that uh, poem while he begins the stanza our uh, first stanza or uh, opening stanza of this poem he tells that in a particular age he was spiritually awake awakened so what is that age whether it is 37 15 24 or 61 so when he was 37 he was awakened to spirituality that's how he is telling in the opening stanza of song of myself the next one which british university figures in william wordsworth's prelude the prelude so wordsworth has written a biographical poem epic poem known as the prelude which was published after his death and he actually says about a particular british university in that or addresses or tells about or mentions a particular british university in his work the prelude so which is that university you have to name that university whether whether it is uh, durham university glasgow university cambridge university or oxford university so he mentions and uh, he uh, the university figures in which uh, in this poem is the cambridge university the next poem sorry the next question child harold's pilgrimage is a so child harold's pilgrimage is written by lord byron and it is a religious allegory fairy tale long poem utopian novel no uh, you know if you know the character of byron he is not going to write a religious allegory or a fairy tale or a, it's not a utopian novel anyway so it's a long poem by byron the next question and denied by what he considered to be the provinciality of the lake poet byron wrote the preface to uh, which of his works as a rebuke to wordsworth on introduction to the thorn so he actually uh, wrote lord byron has written a preface to his own work okay he has written a preface to his own work as a rebuke i say it's a kind of uh, he is telling something against to wordsworth on introduction so wordsworth has written uh, his uh, an introduction by him uh, it's him uh, himself in his work the thorn so wordsworth work is the thorn and he wrote a preface or introduction to this particular work for himself so he actually uh, you know byron got some and you know something was not right for byron there Uh, towards wordsworth so he wrote a preface to which of his work as a rebuk against this introduction wordsworth own introduction to the thorn you have to identify that work by byron uh, for which he himself has written a particular introduction just like wordsworth wrote his own introduction to his work the thorn okay the prisoner of children don juan and child harold's pilgrimage the vision of judgment see you have to understand this all these works are written by byron only 
and the vision of judgment is particularly important because I have seen couple of questions about it. See, the vision of judgment is written by Lord Byron, but a vision of judgment is written by Robert Sade, condemning Byron and Shelley and even Milton as uh, grouping them as Satan's school of poets. Okay, the vision of judgment is by Byron, but a vision of judgment is by uh, written by Sade and a vision of judgment he uh, you know actually condemns and criticizes Byron and uh, Shelley for being uh, and they, he calls them as uh, poets belong to Satan school of uh, uh, poetry and after that Byron wrote uh, uh, you know uh, wrote a kind of answer to a vision of judgment uh, titled as the vision of judgment but the answer for this particular question is Option B, Don Juan. For Don Juan, Byron himself wrote a preface as a rebuke to Wordsworth on introduction to the throne. The next question is, P.B. Shelley's Julian and Mandalo is a conversation between Julian and Count Mandalo. Okay, so Julian and Mandalo, it's a, it comprises a conversation that is happening between Ju, Julian and Count Mandalo. But Julian and Count Mandalo really represents, uh, you know, Two real characters. You have to find uh, find out these characters actually representing whom. So here are the uh, options. Julian represents Keats while Count Mandalo represents Byron. Julian represents Shelley and Count Mandalo Byron. Then Julian represents Shelley and Count Mandalo William Godwin. Julian represents Mary Shelley and Count Mandalo William Godwin. See William Godwin is Mary Shelley's father only. So who is her mother? Western graph. Mary Western graph is the mother to Mary Shelley. So uh, these characters, Julian and Count Mandalo represents Julian is rep uh, Julian represents Shelley and Count Mandalo Byron. So Shelley and Byron they were friends. Okay. The next question in Biographia Literaria, Samuel Taylor Coleridge defines the imagination as the faculty by which. So, in uh, Biography and Literaria, he differentiates between fancy and imagination and he further divides imagination into primary imagination and secondary imagination. So, you, now we have to identify the definition given to imagination uh, as a faculty. So, uh, how college is doing that? The soul perceives the phenomenal diversity of the universe. The soul perceives the spiritual unity of the universe. The soul acquires the images by its associative power. The mind uh, separates images by its discriminatory power. So, uh, he defines the imagination as the faculty by which we can, the soul perceives the spiritual unity of the universe. So, it's a faculty, it's a quality, uh, talent that every human being possesses more or less. Uh, it's, you know, it's a faculty through which or having that faculty you will be able to find the soul perceive the find or our soul perceive the spiritual unity of the universe the next one which of the following phrases is not found in thomas gray's elegy written in country churchyard so elegy written in country churchyard is the graveyard poetry belongs to the graveyard school of poetry and thomas gray belongs to the Age of sensibility that is between, it's a small uh, age between the neoclassical age and romantic age like I said already. And Thomas Gray has written a tremendous uh, elegy there, elegy written in country church. It is not mourning over, but or not mourning over a particular person's death, but it actually mourns over the, you know, um, um, over the, uh, all those country people who uh, are buried there in that uh, graveyard, in that churchyard and they uh, went unknown to the outer world because they are poor and they are country people. He is actually mourning and thinking and uh, brooding over that. So what kind of phrase and which is the phrase that we cannot find in this particular elegy? Far from the madding crowd, a youth of fortune and fame unknown, full many a flower is born to blush unseen. And all nature is but art unknown to thee. So this last sentence is not there. Is this last phrase we cannot find in this particular energy by Gray. All, all nature is but art unknown to thee. Okay. The next question. Who among the following was praised and patronized as the plow poet? You had to understand from the given uh, 
list of poets who is praised and patronized as the flaw poet. John Clare, George Crabbe, Robert Burns and Walter Scott. It is Robert Burns. So Robert Bur uh, Burns is uh, praised and patronized as flaw poet. Next one. In John Gay's Beggar's Opera, what is Peacham's occupation? Okay, so Peacham is a character in Beggar's Opera. So what is the occupation of this character? Pimp, lawyer, fencer of stolen goods and master of a gang of thieves, then impleader of less powerful criminals. So the answer is 3 and 4. That means option A, 3 is fencer of stolen goods and master of a gang of thieves. And he is also an impleader of less powerful criminals. The next question, Thomas Carew's poem. Poems appeared in print in 1640 and contains a variety of amorous addresses to and reflections on a fictional mistress known as. So he, he is a metaphysical poet, Thomas Carew. And his poems appeared, his collection of poems appeared in 1640. And this poem contains a variety of amorous addresses too. And it also contains reflections about a fictional mistress that he himself created. And that what is the name given to that fictional mistress by Thomas Carew? Whether it is Celia, Julia, Anne or Melanie. It is Celia. So the fictional mistress of Carew is Celia. Okay. The next question. Let's move on to the next question. Who, if the following is a cavalier poet? So, who is the for who in the following? Sorry, sorry for this mistake. Who in the following is a cavalier poet? It's uh, George Herbert or John Dunn, Robert Hericot, Robert, uh, sorry, Andrew Marvel. Okay, see if you see John Dunn and Andrew Marvel, they are surely what they are surely metaphysical poets and Robert Herbert, uh, sorry, George Herbert as well. But Robert Herrick, he is a cavalier poet. Cavalier poets belong to the Puritan age. The next one, John Milton's description of gold as a precious bane uh, in the book Paradise Lost Book 2nd is best described as. Okay, so Milton actually uh, des uh, describes uh, gold as a precious bane. It is described as a ductile, an oxymoron, and jabman and zeugma. So it's an oxymoron. And to oxymoron means to a different or to diverse, not familiar, not you know, not similar terms are coming together, and they are creating uh, a, a different kind of uh, all, all you no know, all over a different kind of meaning. That kind of terms phrases are known as oxymorons. Next question in Paradise Lost, which character narrates the story of the making of Eve from a rib in Adam's side? So we are not that uh, you know according to the biblical story, a woman, the first woman Eve is created out of the rib of Adam as a companion to Adam. So in Paradise Lost, who actually describes who is narrating the story of creation of Eve from a rib in Adam's side? Whether it is Adam himself or Eve or Raphael or God. But this uh, particular event is described by Adam himself in or narrated or uh, you know the story of, of Eve's birth is told by Adam in Paradise Lost. And Paradise Lost is written by John Milton. We all know that. The next question, John Dryden's two philosophical religious poems are so, so you have to identify two philosophical religious poems by Dryden from the given list. Absalom and Achitophel, The Layman's Faith, Annas Mirabilis, The Hint and The Panther. So Annas Mirabilis, if you know the story, it is not a philosophical or religious poem. Absalom and Achitophel is not a uh, philosophical poem or philosophical uh, works are not there. And so the answer is Two and four. So the layman's faith and Hind and the Panther. Next question. Who among the following critics discerned in the Shellian lyric the sign of adolescence? So from the given list, you have to identify who among these critics uh, discerned in the Shellian lyric the sign uh, signs of adolescence, whether it is F.R. Lewis, T.S. Eliot, Clay and the Brooks, or I. Richards. 
So Clayan the Brook, Clayan the Brook has written par paradox about paradox, right? The uh, he is telling that how paradox is uh, you know an important and inevitable uh, thing that we can find in every other poem, and that how that's how a, a poem gets its uh, true validity and all. Okay, so uh, so it's by Clayan the Brook who discerns in the Shelley lyric the sign of uh, adolescence. Then, so Brooks has written an essay known as The Language of Paradox. I forgot to mention that. Which of the following described by Robert Browning as a child's story? So, Robert Browning described one of these stories as a child's story. One of these poems as a child's story. So, which is that one? Bells and Pomegranates, Pauline, Fifane at the Fair, The Pied Piper of Heaven. So, this is obviously the last uh, work itself is a story that we often tell uh, to our, our own uh, children and all. So, the last one is the correct answer, The Pied Piper of Hamlin. And Robert Brown calls it as a child's uh, story. The next one. In Robert Brown's dramatic monologue, which painter does Andrea Del Sato compare himself to? What does he find lacking in, in his own work in comparison? See, in uh, the previous uh, section, we found a similar kind of question that uh, which is asking about uh, Andrea Del Sarto is not comparing to himself with which poet? It was Rembrandt. So, Andrea Del Sarto never compares himself with Rembrandt, but he compares with himself with Raphael, Da Vinci, and many more. But he never compare, compares himself with, you know, Rembrandt. But here the question is, uh, from the given list, Andrea Del Sarto is comparing to one of the painters. And he finds something uh, that is missing in his own paintings comparing to that particular painting, painter's work. So, we, what is that? You have to find out that. Fra Lippo Lippi, humor, Raphael, so also. He is comparing himself with Raphael, okay? So, uh, and uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Vermicellitude, and uh, Botticelli, liveliness. So it is the correct answer is Raphael Soul. So he finds that he could write, uh, sorry, he could paint a picture, a portrait of someone more accurately than Raphael if he tried. But even if his words are flawless, uh, it contains no soul. That was a discovery by Andrea del Sarto when he himself compared his paintings with uh, Raphael. Okay. Next work. In which of the following does Robert Sade detail the Indian superstitions as an idolatry to be suppressed by a civilizing Protestant form of colonialism? See here in Robert Sade says that how the superstitious society must be suppressed or superstitious behaviors and uh, tendencies of Indian people should be suppressed by a civilizing Protestant form of colonialism. So, which poem is telling uh, that, uh, that idea of Sade? Uh, it, whether it is Talaba or the curse of Kehema or pity the walls, uh, pitying the walls or country horrors. So, the poem in which Sade uh, tells this idea of him is the curse of Kehema or Kehema. Next one. Next question, which of the following is not a school associated with the romantic period in English literature? So you have to identify in romantic period some movements and some schools and clubs were there. So you have to identify which club or which school is not associated to romantic period. Okay, the Cockney school, the fireside, the lake poet, the satanic school. So it is the fireside, Cockney school, lake poets and satanic school is already there. So it is fireside school. Next one, according to Coleridge, the secondary imagination resolves, diffuse and in order to recreate. Okay, so he mainly describes about the qualities of uh, secondary imagination. It dissolves, it diffuse and dash in order to recreate. What does it again do apart from dissolving and diffusing? Whether it is disintegrating or dissipating or displacing or dissociating. So, it is it dissipate, dissipates. Okay. Secondary imagination dissolves, diffuses, dissipates in order to recreate. Next one. Where there is leisure for fiction, there is little grief. 
was in Samuel Johnson's criticism of a famous poem. So Samuel Johnson makes a criticism of a famous poem through this statement. Where there is leisure for fiction, there is little grief. So you have to identify Samuel Johnson is critical about which poem through this statement. Whether it is P.B. Shillis Adonis, Philip Sidney's Astro and Stella, Thomas Gray's Elegy written in Country Churchyard or John Milton's Listed. See, Philip Sidney and John Milton, they lived before Samuel Johnson. So obviously there is a chance that he uh, comments about their poetry. But Shelley, he, we can find him in the uh, romantic poetry, so sorry, romantic period. So Samuel Johnson's, I don't think that he will get a chance to read even Adonis. So uh, it is the answer is John Milton's Lycidas. Lycidas is a it's a pastoral elegy uh, uh, about his uh, uh, friend, uh, death of his friend by drowning. And you know, uh, Lycidas is a tremendous work too. So that's all about we have finished 100 question I think we have finished 101 questions so yeah I think that was helpful if that was helpful do like my video and also if you have not subscribed to my channel yet you have to subscribe it and that is a great encouragement for me to create such contents related to English language and literature so uh, we are just days before uh, our UGC net so this will be a real help if you go through all these questions and pause the video and read the questions and the two or three times if you have no other time to revise in any way so any other way so uh, if you like the video please press the like button and also share this to your friends and all so yeah, and also you can find me in these platforms my website and in whatsapp number and also in my through my email and in my website www.highpoint.in you will find enormous amount of audio lectures that is sufficient more than enough for you to understand and uh, you know choose the correct answer from all these questions see and it is well explained and uh, comprehensive and simplified too and also in my website if you consider the previous questions you will find previous questions from 2004 onwards and to the latest latest question paper so you can go and check and understand and also you can go and have the uh, free demo materials too and also there you will find pdf materials 300 plus downloadable pdf, PDF materials and uh, you know that is made for you to go through quickly and understand and revise whatever you have already learned so thank you guys for being here and listening to my video let's meet in the next video until then bye bye and thank you